So good morning, everybody. We're going to have the, the session best practice for. We have five presentations for this one. I'm going to try to put my presentation just for the introduction of the people and that's it. And if I share this, yeah, this one, it's fine. Looks good, yes. Yeah, okay. So you can see we have five presentations. First is going to be Javier. Javier, are you ready? And then Wei Liu, Guihan, I don't know how to pronounce it, Guy Baxter, Sarah Mashwell, Karin Hansen, and then Humphrey Key and Joseph. Okay. So just for remind, I want to remind you, you have like 10 minutes. It's fine if you are, if you go a bit longer. And then I will yes, warn if you are too much late, too late. And then I hope we have some questions and answers. I hope everybody's here. Even if you are going to present by video, I'm not sure. So the first I said is Javier. He's a professor from the University of Zaragoza and he's from the computer science department. He's going to talk about the role of Dublin Core in the publication of data. I don't know. So please, Javier, it's your turn. I'm going to stop my, my thing. Thank you, Gemma, for your presentation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, it works. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the role of Dublin Core in the publication of open geospatial data. This is the, the outline of the presentation. I will just describe a bit the, the context of spatial data infrastructures. I will uh, explain that Dublin Core has been a solution for interoperability and friendability. I will also explain the role of Dublin Core in the open data area in the last 10 years, uh, more or less. And I will also talk about the challenge of quality and some conclusions. Well, since the, the middle of the 90s, there is a global acknowledgement of the potential of geographic information for decision making in various areas as agriculture, uh, environment, urban planning, and in general, in electronic government. Therefore, uh, spatial data infrastructures were defined in the middle of the 90s as a coordinated approach to technologies, policies, and institutional arrangements that uh, facilitate the avail availability of and access to spatial data. Uh, well, more or less, uh, in the middle of the 90s, uh, there was an executive order for the establishment of a national spatial data infrastructure in the United States. And this is the beginning of SDIs, let's say. Governments consider SDIs as relevant as other basic infrastructures such as transport, telecommunication, or electricity. And this has happened all around the world since the end of the 90s. For example, in Europe, we have a European directive for the establishment of an infrastructure for spatial information in Europe that is called Inspire. Okay. Um, I just well, think... Yes? Are you saying something? Is it okay? Everything with my connection? Yeah, everything is fine. Um, I think we might have lost um, Gemma, uh, but um, I suggest you you keep going, and okay. Gemma will rejoin. I'm sure. Okay, perfect, no problem. Well, uh, SDIs are a, a network of uh, connected nodes, and in every node, in in a local organization or in a national organization or public body. Usually we have an SDI node that, uh, well, basically it, it has a, a three-tier architecture with, uh, with uh, web services, 
where we have a bottom tire, where we have data and metadata. We have a middleware uh, layer with web services for location, visualization, download and transformation. And uh, the, the upper layer, we have your portals and other kind of applications that make use of these services for locating or visualizing or downloading future and coverage data. And well, the potential of this kind of SDIs is the, the ability to combine data in real time from different sources. We can compose a map that uh, integrates parcels from one institution, roads from a traffic institution, images from remote sensing sources and boundaries from a, an administrative uh, organization. And in this kind of SDIs, metadata is the clue for the different components of an SDI. Metadata describes data, metadata describes services that we can access, and everything is connected uh, with metadata. The problem in this kind of infrastructures is maybe the complexity of metadata. For example, uh, the Federal Geographic Data Committee in the United States uh, proposed the content standard for digital geospatial metadata at the end of the 90s. And uh, an international, at international level, uh, ISO TC211, the Committee for Geomatics and Geographic Information, proposed the, the, the Geographic Information Metadata Standard that was approved in 2003. But the problem of these uh, alternatives is that they have or they contain more, more than 400 elements organized in complex, complex hierarchical structures. And to fill this metadata, we need uh, uh, specialized edition tools. We also need human expertise. And it's really complicated for a company or for a public body to create and maintain up to date uh, this metadata. That's why since uh, the beginning of this century, since 2000, Dublin Car has been used as a solution for interoperability and findability and for simplicity. It provides interoperability between different geographic information producers and geographic metadata standards, and it also provides interoperability across different application domains. If we talk about interoperability between, between different geographic metadata standards, we can remark that uh, the specification for catalog services that was proposed by the organization Open Geospatial Consortium between 2003 and 2007 don't use directly ISO 19115 or the Federal Geographic Data Committee metadata standard, but it's based on public core properties for establish uh, the queries in the catalog and also for the, the properties that are returned in the result records because it's much more simple, it's much more simpler and it's easy to provide interoperability if one organization is using the American standard or another organization was using the international ISO 19115 standard or other standards that were used also, for example, for remote sensing. Um, and also Dublin Cover uh, was used for interoperability across different application domains because of the complexity of the standard and because geographic information is also useful in other domains, not so focused on geographic information systems. Well, for example, th there was a mapping in 2000 established by, by the United States Geolog Geological Survey between the American Standard and Dublin Core. And also there, are, there were different approaches to establish a mapping with, between ISO 19115 and Dublin Core in different European projects, for example, the TEMI project, or for example, the European European Standardization Organization, SEN, the Committee European de Normalization, established uh, a workshop 
about uh, the use of Dublin Core for uh, describing multimedia, multimedia information. And myself and other people participated in a project focus on uh, improving the discovery of geographic information in cross-domain searching by means of Dublin Core. So we established a mapping within, between the ISO standard and Dublin Core, and we also propose some guidelines for the development of crosswalls, automatic tools, automatic programs to generate the transformation between both standards. Okay. Uh, in the last 10 years, we can say that uh, the launch of open data initiatives has encouraged also the distribution of geographic information through open data portals. And open data portals are a big competitor to spatial data infrastructures because geospatial data are usually also open government data. So now we are moving from the use of uh, specialized uh, catalog services specifications using SDIs to the typical software that is using open data servers. Okay. And well, in this open data era, it's clear that Dublin Core is the, the basis for the vocabularies that we are using for the description of open data data sets. Okay, because DCAT was established in 2012. Uh, the European Commission created a specific profile for the descriptions of, description of open data data sets in 2013. And even in 2015, the European Commission proposed an, estes, an extension of DCAT AP for geographic information that is called GeoDCAT AP. And this extension was proposed or was designed to assure compliance with the European Inspired Directive and also with the basic elements of ISO 19115. For example, we apply this for a European project uh, the last two years, a project called Traffair, Understanding Traffic Flows to Improve Air Quality. It was a project uh, designed to establish the necessary infrastructure to estimate the pollution level on urban scales. We propose an infrastructure for six different European cities. And the important thing is that one of the sub goals was also to publish monitoring and forecasting air quality and traffic data as open data. So this is an example of the use of GeoDCAT IP. We try to, to make it very simple. Um, we were using just the core properties of this uh, profile to establish uh, a mapping with ISO 19115. And we try to use the properties that are compatible with DCAT AP. Uh, that is to say, our, our, our idea was to use the, the elements that are editable with uh, the, the most uh, well known software, CCAN or Socrata or other quite uh, well-known softwares for open data catalogs. And in this project, we also try to uh, automate as much as possible the, the, the generation of metadata because we consider that um, geospatial data it's, uh, is produced every day and we produce a, a lot of information and it's not possible to edit everything uh, with a human supervision. So we try to generate metadata directly from the capabilities of our services, from, from our data servers. So we try directly to extract the properties of the different layers that we were creating in a GeoServer software. That is a software for, for publishing geographic information. And directly, we try to generate DCAT metadata from the basic properties of, of these layers. And well, we, we apply this in four, three different cities of the project. And 
well, we develop software that uh, harvests the basic properties of data servers in the different cities and directly we ingest the, the metadata in, in local open data catalogs and this metadata is harvested by intermediate servers like regional open data servers and national servers and finally the metadata reach the European data portal and the data sets are published directly there. Okay, um, well, this is more the or less experience in different projects uh, in the last 20 years and uh, I also consider that it's important that uh, we should pay attention to the quality of metadata because usually the standardization efforts with different metadata standards include test suites to assure interoperability, that is to say to assure completeness, the commission or omission of metadata elements according to the different metadata standards, and also they assure the consistency, the compliance with metadata formats and the structure and domain of metadata elements. However, uh, we pay less attention to the accuracy and to have up-to-date metadata. Uh, nowadays, you can find sometimes metadata records in a national catalog that describe, uh, for example, a boundaries map, but it's classified as using or as providing land use data. And sometimes, for example, you, you can also find uh, links that are broken or that uh, point to an unreachable website. And maybe this is something specific for geographic metadata because th there was an obligation to generate metadata records in spatial data infrastructures, but maybe they are not essential as in other domains, maybe in a library, because uh, final users uh, can visualize or, re or render these digital assets through online map clients, through OpenStreetMap, or maybe through Google Maps. But um, the basic pieces of data sets, well, are sometimes very, not very well described or not very well up to date. There are some approaches to verify the quality of metadata. For example, in the case of the European Data Portal, uh, we have a metadata quality assessment methodology that is based on the FAIR principles that is to say the unfindability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability, but uh, there are not special checks on the accuracy of metadata. In the last two, three years, I collaborated with other researchers on, on a methodology based on ISO 19157, which is the standard for data quality in the geographic information context, and we have tried to uh, adapt this to open data metadata. And we also provide uh, controls and checks on the accuracy and correctness of temporal, positional, and not quantitative attribute information, because we consider that this is important. If we make a sample-based control on the different holdings of open data portals, you have the situation that many of these controls that check directly the, the accuracy uh, tell us that, uh, well, the sample that we are checking is, is not passing the control. Okay, so we have uh, errors and we have uh, facts that are not up to date. Okay, so I just finished now. Sorry for my delay. Okay, uh, as a conclusion, we, we consider or that the Dublin Core is flexible enough to describe your spatial data. With our experience in the last 20 years, we have noticed the importance of having assisted processes for the automatic generation of metadata. And we also consider that uh, we must pay attention on the quality of this metadata to be really useful. Okay, so thank you very much. And that's all from my part. Okay. okay, thank you. 
There is any question? I haven't seen nothing from people or we can just wait after the follow -up, the presentations. Are you going to stay here? Yes, yes, I will be here. Okay, nice. So now it's the turn. Let me check. Oh. So now Javier is finished. Now, Quijan and Wei Liu. Now we have good connection. Yes. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, is this okay for my screen? Yeah. Is this a, the... not full screen? Okay. Now it's fine. Full screen. Fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, Hi, will you? Okay. Can I start? Yeah, it's your turn. Okay. Or it's yours. Uh, we, we, we thought we had a total uh, 30 minutes. Now we only have 10 minutes. So I have to make it short to leave, uh, leave more time for my colleague, uh, Ms. Xia Chui Juan. Uh, as presented uh, by Professor Arrow in the opening keynote presentation, current semantic technologies have been able to provide a content architecture to digital humanities platform rather than just an IT architecture enabling uh, basic data management and retrieval functions. This content architecture not only allows users to find the documents they want, but also to ask questions direct, directly by curing knowledge in the documents. And the platform can aggregate data across repositories, uh, support heuristic and relevance retrieval, give associated and as comprehensive answers as possible, and present them with visualization. This idea coincident with the work we are doing at Shanghai Library, although we are in a much smaller scale. Today, uh, I uh, and uh, my colleague Xia Chui Juan uh, would like to present to you our similar effort, as well as our difficulties, lessons, and concerns. Uh, th this is our agenda. Uh, uh, the third part will be presented by uh, Xia Chui Juan, which focuses on the design of Shanghai Library Digital Humanity Platform that we also hope to provide like a series of sample projects introduced by Professor Arrow. It is consists of a semantic architecture layer, which contains a large number of domain ontologies, including domain thesaurus, terminologies, and naming lists, such as people, institution, times, place, geographical resources, events, bibliographic, and the various schemas. By doing this, the huge amount of document resources that Shanghai Library can be weaved into a large knowledge network. We have been digitizing library collections for more than a quarter century, and now it is time to make the most from it by extracting the knowledge from it with semantic technologies. We are still in the designing phase. Some of the results are still just a demo system. Uh, this yin yang bagua diagram describes the two aspects of digital humanities, data and methods. While data consists of documents, physical objects, and intangible objects, they all, they, are, they all have digital surrogates in the virtual world and methods consist of technologies, procedures and behaviors. Uh, there are current three types of Chinese digital humanity platforms, uh, that is metadata search system, full text system, or, and uh, semantic knowledge system uh, like YONO. 
we just have some uh, semantic knowledge system. Um, um, most of them uh, 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 produced by Shanghai Library in China. Uh, so uh, the current uh, digital humanity infrastructure is still confusing uh, with all three types of system co coexisting. Uh, let's move to the second part. As we search for the right technology approach, a new form of architecture came into view. The data middle platform architecture, which originated from Alibaba. The data middle platform is in the middle of the front end and the back end. It mainly solves the contradiction between the need for stability and the robustness in the back end and the need for more agile and flexibility in the front end. It is an enterprise level data sharing and ability reuse platform. Shanghai Library is upgrading its enterprise IT infrastructure this year. We use the folio, uh, it's a microsystem, uh, a microservice system. We have introduced a set of latest next, next generation uh, library service platform as a unified platform to host all applications. We have embedded a data middle platform in Folio and try to provide open linked data and ontology services into it to realize the digital humanity content service with a way in vision. The ontology, ontologies provide a framework for the content architecture. The data middle platform can be seen as an implementation of content architecture. I will skip this uh, slide. Uh, the diagram illustrates the basic components of our data middle platform. It has an ontology enabled data architecture, consists of data acquisition, uh, processing governance modules, and uh, provide access management by human interface and APIs and all kinds of necessary operation functions and analysis tools. This architecture is also subject to change during the development and implementation process. I will give, give, give away the stage to Mr. Sha to continue our presentation. So please, I will stop sharing. Okay. Uh, which... Okay, let's my uh, let's uh, share my screen. Can you can you see my screen? Yes, no problem. It's okay. It's okay. Everything's okay. Okay. Okay, it's my pleasure to talk about the design of the digital humanities platform of Shanghai Library after Kevin. Firstly, uh, the content and the technical architecture. Uh, in the past few years, we have transformed the silos of digital library systems into the interlinked uh, knowledge bases based on ontology and the linked open data technologies. Now we have developed more than uh, 20 knowledge bases with more than 300 million of RDF triples, including knowledge bases of entities and knowledge bases of collections. Uh, from the beginning of the last year, we started the historical and humanities big data platform project. Uh, it's, uh, it's a digital, uh, digital humanities platform which uh, needs to be one portal to access all data and digital resource objects from the different special collections. And one, gene, well, one search engine to uh, search all knowledge bases were developed in the past five years. And one knowledge organization system and the data linking hub to integrate all kinds of digital resources. And then 
one service platform to support the new digital humanities research paradigms. The content architecture to link all data together is based on one unified ontology for data modeling with RDF specification for knowledge representation and the knowledge uh, and the linked open data technologies for data publishing, interlinking and open access. The one unified ontology are integrated from different ontology application profiles of different special collections. On the basis of metadata application profile, the concept of ontology application profile is proposed for special collections. The ontology application profile, uh, we have developed the ontology application profile of genealogy, manuscript, and archives. Asian books and the Shanghai memory, including multimedia resources separately. And there are um, some core classes reused from the famous vocabularies, such as Bibframe, schema.org, uh, and the FOF, and so on, by every single ontology application profile designed for the specific requirements. By this way, all the entities and the digital resources with HTTP URIs are linked together semantically. This is the technical architecture of the platform, which is developed into four independent layers. The digital objects layer, entities layer, open data interface layer, and the service layer. And for those knowledge bases based on ontology and the linked open technologies, we designed a Fedora search engine through APIs provided by the ELAS search index of every single knowledge base. Now I will introduce the digital humanities research paradigms that the uh, platform can support. This is, the, uh, this is the statistics and analysis visualization for the search results. And this is the text analysis functions for word frequency count, statistics and visualization to support distant reading. And we also use triple IF for displaying, sharing, and annotation of the scanned images by users. And the GIS technologies can, can help users search and visualize big data on one map. We are developing a his historical GIS data architecture. Now the search results can display on the map and the users can search all the data of different knowledge bases on the map by inputting keywords or drawing a polygon. And the users can explore all kinds of relationships among people, other entities, and all kinds of digital resources in a social network system. Finally, I will share some interesting use cases. In this case, the information about the architectures of newspaper publishers can display on a map with a timeline of 100 years. We can see uh, the architectures are built one after another in different time when the timeline changes. And the social network of people worked in the newspaper organizations or the authors wrote articles for the newspapers in the past 100 years. We think this kind of data visualization can help the data-driven studies of publication history in Shanghai. This is another example of using genealogy data for data visualization. We extracted structured data about the members of a family from the scanned images of genealogy documents and then transform the structured data into semantic data with relationships among people. With this data, an artist named, named Xiang Fan from Tsinghua University designed many kinds of digital family trees with data visualization technologies. This kind of artistic works 
is a brand new way to make the data more valuable and beautiful. Okay, that's all my presentation. Thanks for your all. Uh, thanks for Kevin and also for the team members of Shanghai Library. Okay. Share. Uh, Gemma, we can't hear you. you, you you're you muted. Yeah, sorry. I just said thank you. It was very interesting. And also that I like the most the last slide with these beautiful things you presented. It was it was funny. So I'm going to give the floor for the next one. Let me. Oh, I don't know. Because I have uh, Sharon and Guy Baxter, do you want to play the the presentation? I play the presentation. If you want to share it, that's fine, or I can share it. Okay, I put it. Let me see. One second. Is in here. <clears throat> A bit slow now. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's in downloads. Yeah, this one. Now it's fine. Let me see, do it again. Compartir. Basic here. Now. Okay. Hello, I'm Guy Baxter. I'm joined by my colleagues, Sharon Maxwell. We're going to be talking about the archives of creative practice, metadata challenges from the physical, digital, and intangible. First slide, please. These are some of the questions that the archives of creative practice raise. I wish I could say that this talk will provide the answers to all of them, but it will not even come close. However, while the first three questions are a challenge to us, how do we capture the essence of an idea? When does creativity happen? Is there a finished work? And can that even be recorded? The next three questions perhaps suggest a way forward, and we'll start to explore some of that in our talk based on the experiences we have had at the University of Reading in the UK. So where does creativity intersect with cataloging metadata? Can knowledge of the creative process aid understanding of what we see in the archive? And might a broad interdisciplinary approach help us to navigate the issues? And does this help the archivist in practice? Next slide, please. The challenges of creative practice in terms of archival cataloging are <coughs> and these include complexity, complexity, even chaos, as seen here with uh, a view of the artist Francis Bacon's studio in Dublin. Oh, I think we lost audio. Is that possible? There is an incentive, in fact, okay. for falsifying the record, which one, sorry, one sorry. tends to see less with other archives. Thirdly, there's the intangibility of the process, and sometimes, as with a live performance, intangibility of the work itself. In our projects, we have often found overlap with intangible cultural heritage, whether studying crafts through our Museum of the Intangible project, or looking at the collecting of internet memes, some work we did alongside National Media Museum and with the researcher Aaron Rees. And fourthly, in creative work, there is a sense of constant reinvention and reinterpretation. An example would be the red shoes. By the red shoes, do we mean the original Hans Christian Andersen story? 
do we mean Robert Helpman's ballet interpretation sequence, which is within a film also called The Red Shoes? Or do we mean the musician Kate Bush's album, which was inspired by that film and the sequence within it? Next slide, please. This means that the metadata standards we attempt to apply when cataloging and when making accessible the archives of creative work often and perhaps inevitably fall short. What are some of the reasons for that? Well, metadata standards reflect the dominant holdings. An example from our own work relates to the PRONOM database maintained by the UK National Archives and considered a highly authoritative source for file format identification records. PRONOM, we have found, lists very few Apple products. There's no entry, for instance, for Final Cut Pro, which is the main editing software used by independent filmmakers, and no entry for Avid Media Composer, the choice of many professionals. This is simply because they are little used in government and public service organisations. The standards reflect the dominant context and the dominant content. In our work on another project, and in my own work prior to that, we encountered the absence of a standard for recording live performances and theatrical productions. There have been several bold attempts to resolve this. Internet Broadway database in the United States, the excellent OzStage and Ibsen Stage projects, and our own PADB project, which underpins pins the Staging Beckett website, which you can see a screenshot from here. However, despite goodwill from all those involved, work in this area remains somewhat fragmented. It's perhaps no surprise that the standards in this area fall short. Creative work by its nature pushes at the boundaries. And so describing its archives will always be more challenging than describing those of functions and activities where stability of practice or stability of approach is more the norm, land ownership, for instance, or education. Of course, the advent of born digital records disturbs record keeping practices across the board. But in the case of creativity, it piles complexity on top of complexity. And finally, there is a paradox here. Metadata standards require even impose a rigidity or they wouldn't be standards. Achieving findability and visibility for records of creative practice means a compromise. An artist may not consider their work to fit into a category, but to some extent, the records of that work must if only at the level of being considered archival. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Sharon Maxwell now. Thank you, Guy. I want to highlight our work on the Stephen Droskin archive, a hybrid archive comprising around 120 boxes of physical material and 20 hard disk drives. This is an archive of a filmmaker, a key figure in the history of experimental cinema, whose work tackled the subjects of disability, illness, desire and human subjectivity. The archive preserves evidence of his work and life from 1960 to 2012 when Groskin died. In some ways, his creative practice may now be uncovered by researchers who analyse not only his films, but also his archive, looking at the way he arranged his physical files and the way he structured and accessed his data files. Around 12 terabytes of data has been recovered by imaging the hard disk drives and extracting content using Bitcurator. And there has been analysis on this data using digital forensic techniques. So the digital part of the collection has in effect expanded due to processing and now contains not only the original hard disk drives, but also disk images and reports and extracted content, for example, images, film clips and emails. We are cataloguing all these various elements of the digital part of the archive and we'll use the catalog descriptions to explain the relationships between the elements of the archive and move away from using the hierarchical organisation of the catalogue to explain the order of the collection. This will provide multiple en entry points for the user to descriptions of the digital content, while the traditional use of subject access records for titles of work will link descriptions of the physical and digital content. The interdisciplinary nature of this project has allowed collaboration with the digital forensics team at University of Glasgow to aid catalogue arrangement and the creation of descriptions. Glasgow have produced visualisations and MacB timelines for the recovered data. We are exploring how these kinds of outputs can help archivists generate catalogue descriptions by allowing the archivists to process large volumes of data more easily 
and we were also investigating the possibility of visualizations and timelines being part of the catalog metadata that is eventually presented to the user. In some ways, the hardest part of this cataloging project for me has been how best to represent the required metadata from premise within the fields available to me in our AdLib database, fields which are based on the ISAB-G standard. It has felt like I'm trying to shoehorn data into fields. If you are new to cataloging digital files, it can also be difficult to understand what you are looking at and where to find the relevant catalog metadata within the files themselves. Our in-house cataloging manual will present our best practice and explain the metadata required in certain fields when cataloging digital content and hopefully where to obtain that information from. This manual may be the next best thing to purchasing a more up-to-date content management system at this point. I'll now hand back to Guy to finish off. Thank you, Sharon. Can I have the next slide, please? So those engaged in research about creative work, in our experience, are actually among the most enthusiastic and knowledgeable users of archives. And for us, one of the challenges is ensuring that archivists are able to respond positively to that enthusiasm, rather than simply throwing up barriers and saying that this doesn't fit with our practice. Another thing that we feel may happen in the future as digital arts become more widely accessible is that the potential digital archive of creative practice may well grow. This means that the work that's been done, for instance, in the Stephen Dwoskin project will become really important in looking at, at future archives, which may or may not be the, the same, have the same challenges in terms of hardware or software. In conclusion, Archivists and data scientists need to work closely with those that have knowledge of the creative process in order to explore these ways of capturing and describing records. The Stephen Dwoskin project has been an excellent example of that. And perhaps has led us to the conclusion that only an interdisciplinary approach can work. Thank you very much for listening. Okay. Okay, thank you. It was nice and you really fit to the point, to the time. And now we are going to talk with Karin. Let me. Let me see. One second. Yeah, so you have already put your presentation. It's fine. Okay. So, Karin. Okay, uh, I'll start. And um, I have a pretty short presentation, so maybe we'll have time for questions afterward. Okay. Uh, good morning. My name is Karin Hansson, and I'm going to present an interface study of the open research data repositories, practices, norms, and metadata for sharing images. And this is done together with Anna Neslund Dahlgren at Stockholm University, the Department of Culture and Aesthetics. The study is also part of a larger research project uh, that we call Metadata Culture. And it's about the politics of metadata and also the de development of digital sharing practices in the visual cultural heritage. Focus. Uh, is researchers in the humanities having images as a central part of their research material and is funded by the Swedish Research Council. And then why uh, do we choose uh, to study open research data repositories? Well, in our previous research, um, our informants often express uncertainty on how to deal with increased demand for sharing their data. And we were also curious about how we might share our own results more directly. So we have started to investigate some open research data repositories with these needs in mind. Several problems have been highlighted as to why especially humanities scholars have been reluctant to use open data repositories. The problem is situated foremost as being with the researcher that they are too individualistic, 
uh, as are their research processes, that they might feel estranged by the datafication and built in norms about the research process that exist in some repositories. Legal issues are, of course, another obstacle, such as problems with copyright that limit the rights to collect, store, and reproduce the data acquired because those rights belong to others, as is the case with a considerable body of created artifacts, which are the objects of study in the humanities. Previous research also shows that a lack of qualified metadata hinders the reuse and sharing of data. Actually, in all disciplines, also in natural sciences. There is also lack of knowledge about what metadata these open research data repositories use in more detail. In this interface study, we have therefore looked at the norms embedded in the technology, expressed in the datafication and in the interface aesthetics. We are also looking more closely at what the interfaces make possible in terms of metadata, asking what types of data are categorized and measured in the interfaces and which are not. We have analyzed five open data repositories designed for individual or smaller groups of researchers, research gate data, humanities commons core deposit, Harvard Dataverse, Figshare, and Zenodo. These repositories have in common that they are open and free to use, directed to the humanities, among others. They allow images as data and represent some of the more popular data deposits in the English speaking world. We included Humanities Commons Core for comparison, despite it's not so big, as it's designed with the humanities in mind unlike the others, which are directed also to other types of researchers. We engage with these tools during a six month period, creating profiles, uploading data and publications, participating in groups and so on, focusing on signifiers or research paradigms, but also on the technical means for metadata production. And the results show that multiple norms about research are expressed in the design of these interfaces. Some of them might estrange humanists, like referring to research labs, but far from all. However, when it comes to how the data is described in these contexts, it makes sense in a publication setting, but not for describing research material, for example, in art history. Also, when it comes to the technical means for metadata production on a system level, what they all share is a focus on publishing, concentrating on scholarly publications rather than sharing data for reuse. When counting the metadata categories, publishing, we found more than four times as many as the categories in the two other metadata types together. The interfaces are those primarily designed to collect metadata that is important for understanding the position of the data within the metrics uh, of the research world, collecting publication metrics such as funding, academic institution, journal, conference, research subject, and so on. Metadata is also found on different levels, either as a description of the collection of files, the so-called data set, or as, as a description of the data. And here we found that metadata is mainly at the data set level, which is therefore very difficult to create qualified metadata for individual image files in these data repositories. This shows that in the interface, data is treated as a homogeneous entity, nothing that can be categorized in any detail at file level, if at all. For example, a data set could include information about the type of images, like portraits, or the full span of its production period. However, when it comes to individual images, for example, the names of the people portrayed, the photographers who have produced these images, their gender, nationality, the context of their very production context. This type of information that is interesting for, uh, for example, an art historian. This cannot be covered by any of these metadata templates.
In conclusion, the focus is on placing the data set within an academic publishing context, meaning what can mainly be shared and reused in these systems is not the content of the data, rather the priority is sharing data about the researcher. Sharing images as data on a larger scale requires a different design for data repositories, a design that puts the research material at the center instead of the researcher. Thank you for listening and please read more about our project at the website. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you, Karin. It was, yeah, really tied to the time. <laughs> it's fine. Thank you. It was very clear. I liked the conclusion. We have a lot of questions, but we have still one presentation. I don't know if they are connected. Yeah. Well, I think I need to share. Oh, okay. this is what I have. I guess my, my presentation is the time from Humphrey and Joseph Kiplanghat, but I don't have the video or the presentation to show. I, so, I have I have the video. Um, we just need okay. to confirm with with Humphrey that that is his uh, preference uh, that I play the video. I think it is. So I going to stop your sh your screen yeah. sharing and I'm going to share the uh, the video uh, oh, I see how frequented yeah okay. um, that does not look correct is that oh it is okay does is that are you seeing a blank screen yeah. <laughs> okay hang on just one second um, Okay. Okay, started. Is that okay? Yeah. Good. Uh, good morning. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizers of this DCMI conference of 2021 for inviting us uh, to make a presentation under the sub theme of best practice uh, presentation from Kenya. Uh, the title of our paper is Institutional Repositories Metadata Approaches and Challenges in University Libraries in Kenya. My name is uh, Joseph Kiplangat, and my co-presenter is Humphrey Kerr. There are um, several universities in Kenya currently, about 79, both public and private, and a lot of efforts have been done in harnessing the local content uh, through development of institutional repositories. Uh, this has enhanced success uh, to information resources in terms of thesis, uh, dissertations, uh, great literature, scientific reports, books, and journals. However, it has been established that Although a lot of efforts have been done in harnessing the local content, uh, university libraries are currently using different uh, softwares and tools in terms of organization and of course in terms of access. So faculty members and uh, students are actually at uh, times of course uh, uh, have challenges in terms of uh, accessing these uh, uh, resources. Our paper is informed by the fact that um, Dublin Core metadata schema has also been used in organizing, in supporting the organization of these uh, information resources. 
Uh, so we carried out a survey uh, in selected university libraries and uh, my co-presenter will actually go through uh, the findings, what we found out and uh, the recommendations that we are making uh, to enhance success uh, to inf information resources uh, within uh, institutional repositories in university libraries in Kenya. So I take this opportunity to welcome my co-presenter, uh, Mr. Humphrey Kea, uh, to continue with the presentation. Welcome, Humphrey. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Diplangat. Um, hello, colleagues. As you will have heard from Prof, my name is uh, Humphrey Kerr, and I'm a private uh, information and knowledge management consultant based here in Nairobi. So I will pick up from my colleague uh, in this uh, best practice presentation on uh, institutional repositories metadata, and we are looking at the approaches and challenges in uh, university libraries in Kenya. So briefly, to begin with, um, this is how we have structured our presentation. The content, uh, we shall begin with a few definitions on what an institutional repository is, metadata, then uh, uh, the approaches and challenges that uh, universities are employing uh, to uh, assist discovery through institutional repositories. And in looking at the challenges, we shall also address uh, the methodology that we use. Then we shall end up with the recommendations and the conclusions and the list of references at the end. So institutional repositories are um, archives for collecting, preserving, and disseminating digital copies of intellectual outputs of institutions, particularly research institutions where universities are included. And there are uh, different content types, as uh, uh, my colleague mentioned. We have monographs, we have got uh, preprints and postprints of uh, uh, academic journal articles, that is uh, before and after undergoing peer, peer review. We have uh, electronic thesis and dissertations, digital assets generated by academics, e.g. data sets. Uh, we can also have administrative documents. We can have course notes, learning objects, and conference proceedings. And uh, the content is uh, uh, sometimes uh, mandated by the institutions, like uh, the universities uh, themselves. Then um, on metadata, we know that uh, data um, that is stored in the repositories has to be de described. So metadata is data that provides information about other data, but not the actual content of the data, such as the text of a message or the image itself. And there are uh, different categories of metadata. We have a uh, descriptive, which is used for discovery and identification purposes. Uh, examples of this uh, include like title, abstract, author, and keywords. Then we can have administrative metadata for managing resources, for example, uh, resource types, permissions, when and how the, uh, the resources were created. Uh, and and uh, we also have statistical metadata, also called process data, which uh, uh, may describe processes that collect, process, and produce statistical data. Then we can have a uh, structural uh, metadata, uh, which uh, is about containers of data that indicates how compound objects are put together. For example, uh, how pages are ordered to form a chapter. It uh, describes the types, versions, and the relationships and other characteristics of uh, digital materials. Then uh, we can also have reference uh, metadata that is information about the contents and quality of statistical data. Then uh, finally, we can have legal uh, metadata that's information about the creator, copyright holder, 
public licensing uh, if uh, provided. So in terms of the approaches and challenges, we have got uh, different approaches and challenges by the various institutions. And uh, in uh, addressing the approaches and challenges, uh, this is the methodology that we adopted. We selected uh, 10 uh, institutional repositories of Kenyan universities. And the categories were public and private universities, whereby we selected five from public and five from private, giving us a total of uh, 10 out of 45 institutions that uh, avail the, their information online on uh, institutional repositories. That's a percentage of 22.22%. Then uh, we proceeded to inspect uh, the content of these uh, repositories uh, by looking at the metadata that has been uh, employed and the quality of that metadata. And then uh, we concluded with the identification of the challenges that uh, these institutions are likely to face or they are facing currently. So one of the approaches, we looked at the technologies used for IRs in Kenya. And uh, it emerged that uh, most universities are promoting discovery of institutional research outputs through institutional repositories. And uh, this uh, we were able to get uh, through the open door site, that is the directory of open access repositories, whereby Kenya has 45 institutional repositories. And uh, out of these 45, we found that 93% uh, of them are employing DSpace as a means of uh, uh, subjecting their content to discovery through institutional repositories. Then we have 2%, uh, ePrints and Greenstone 2%, and other softwares 2%. So you can see DSpace takes the lion's share in terms of the software for institutional repositories. Um, so in terms of the technology, we can see this space was leading with 93%. Then um, the metadata schema, as we can see, is the uh, Dublin Co. Uh, this space uh, uses Dublin Co. metadata schema with the 15 elements. Then uh, we, we also found that in terms of the approaches, the knowledge is organized in terms of communities and collections. However, the naming is uh, specific to institutions. Uh, there was no standard way of naming uh, the communities and collections. Then uh, we had uh, on the open door, uh, uh, that is one of the approaches uh, that uh, the universities are using to promote discovery. They have put all their institutional repositories on the directory of open access repositories. That is open door. Then uh, in terms of information access, we have a blend of both uh, restricted and uh, public domain content. Uh, some of the materials res is restricted, so it requires authentication. And then uh, there is that which is available without authentication on public domain. Then keyword indexing. Uh, keywords are assigned uh, with the DC subject element, uh, which is an, an element of the uh, Dublin Core metadata schema. So challenges. Uh, with all that, we find that uh, the various uh, institutions still uh, have some challenges to cope with. Uh, the first one is in terms of technology. Uh, we ask ourselves at this point, considering that uh, other countries like the US, uh, UK, Germany, Japan, and France uh, have got uh, lower uh, usage of uh, this space as a solution for institutional repositories, we ask ourselves, is this space the best solution for all the universities in Kenya? Probably that is something that we need to um, revisit uh, with the institutions, looking at their various needs and comparing with other uh, institutional repositories uh, elsewhere. Then uh, we have uh, authority control. In terms of authority control, there is inconsistent entries in author and corporate author fields among the institutional repositories. 
So that's a challenge that uh, may need to be addressed. Then uh, knowledge organization, categorization is unclear. In some cases, e.g. books are categorized under communities instead of collections. Then we also found that in terms of keyword indexing, um, voc the vocabulary encoding schema is not indicated. For example, it's not clear whether these uh, some of the keywords are author assigned or they're using a, a vocabulary encoding schema like a Library of Congress subject headings, uh, art and architecture the thesaurus, or the thesaurus for ge geographic names, for example. So that is a challenge. Then uh, now our recommendation, we looked at it in terms of knowledge organization, uh, value vocabularies, and uh, authority control. So in terms of knowledge organization, we recommend that uh, the uh, communities are organized based on the user, for example, departments, schools, and faculties within institutions, which some of the institutions are already doing. But as we said, this was not uh, standard across the uh, repositories. Then uh, we also recommend uh, organization of collections in terms of the subjects and in, in terms of the content types. Then uh, also we recommend uh, implementation of uh, value vocabularies uh, to facilitate discovery. We need a controlled vocabulary from uh, uh, value vocabularies, uh, such as uh, LCSH, AAT, TGN, Agrovoc, to be indicated, and hy hyperlinks to the concepts uh, to be provided. Uh, from the value vocabularies. This will uh, assist discovery through the semantic web. Then uh, we have got uh, authority control. We need to have a standardized uh, way of uh, entering the author and corporate author entries uh, based on authority files. For example, the virtual international authority file, VF, or the Library of Congress name authority file. LCNAF, um, and also indicate authorities used for name authority control, which, which type of uh, authority are we using, and link the name values to associated name authority files uh, via hyperlinks, just as with the value vocabularies. So in conclusion, uh, IRs are a positive step toward uh, enhancing discovery of research outputs from Africa. A lot of uh, information has been residing as silos in most of the uh, libraries, but with IRs now we are seeing a, a forward step towards enhancing discovery of research outputs from Africa. Then the scope for more work, uh, there is a scope for more work to maximize discovery of IR content uh, through semantic web. So this is an opportunity to conduct further research into uh, institutions and uh, see how uh, discovery can be enhanced uh, through the semantic web. Uh, thank you very much and for your time. And uh, now we invite uh, your comments and uh, further, further input. Thank you. Thank you very much was very clear. Yeah, we, we have finished. So thank you everybody for your presentations, video or not video, I liked a lot. And see you in the next, there are going to be more presentations this afternoon, I think. So, that's right, yes. That's right. So see you later. If thank you, you thank you, Gemma, for the great moderating. Oh. Okay. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you all thank for the great presentations. Thank you all. Bye. 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 Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.